Hi, Al. Thank you so much for being here, wherever here is that you are. I've got about an eight minute intro planned here, followed by about 25 minutes of reading and then a Q and A. Before I introduce myself, I just wanna let you know that you can access the almost perfect transcript of this event below the live stream video. Following the event, you'll be able to access a recording with accurate closed captions for both the reading and the Q&A that will follow. So if you see me using my mouse to scroll over here, that's just because I'm managing the transcript, both for greater accuracy in the closed captioning and so as to prevent myself from ad-libbing and making bad jokes. And that does mean that any bad jokes that show up in the transcript are bad jokes I intended, so judge accordingly. I'll tell you also that once I begin reading poems from the book, I'll reference their page numbers for folks who pre-ordered and would prefer to follow along. I'm modeling this practice off the first pandemic YouTube book launch I, intended, I attended, Elizabeth Deanna Morris Lake's launch of her book, Ashley Sugar Notch and the Wolf. Thanks, Liz. I'm Billy R. Tadros, and today is the official release day for my second book of poems, Was Body, published by Indolent Books. If this launch were in person, someone would have the misfortune of introducing me. But as the only other person living in my house is my wife, who's currently upstairs babysitting our dogs so they don't interrupt this reading, I'll take on that misfortune. Just a quick bio. I'm a graduate of the PhD program in English at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, of the MFA program in writing at Sarah Lawrence College, and of the Writers Institute at Susquehanna University. And on a good day, at least two out of the three of those institutions will claim me as their own. I now teach at the University of Scranton in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which as some of you recently learned from Twitter is in fact a real place, a place I'm proud to live with my wife, Brooke, and our two rescue dogs, Mackenzie and Yogi, and with a whole lot of plaid. And with our two hatchbacks, the only one of those is a Subaru. Anything else you want to know that I want you to know, you can find it at my website, www.billyrtadros.com. I'm working on a contact section about this on the website, but I'll say too that it would be my honor and privilege to visit or virtually visit any of your classrooms or organizations if you have use for me or this book. In the meantime, while I get that contact section set up, you can email me from the website. I've got a few important thank yous and announcements before I introduce the book. Lest you think this long list of thank yous is self-aggrandizing or find yourself wishing for some Oscars ceremony style orchestral swell to cue me to wrap it up, I'll just say that gratitude is something I want to be not only practicing, but actively extending right now, even if that takes a few extra minutes. So freshen your drink if you have to. I timed this and it should only take about five more minutes. I want to start by thanking the people responsible for taking this project from manuscript to book, beginning with the folks at Indolent Books in particular. Special thank yous first to Samantha Pius, who reached out to me in 2018 after reading a poem of mine that appeared in Lavender Review, part of an Ava Sedarian alphabetical series called 26 Words for Volva that I have been working on for nine years and haven't finished. Because she advocated for the voice in that poem, these poems have found a home. Thank you to Lisa DeSiro for her careful editorial work with this collection and her thoughtful responses to these poems and to Adam Bohannon for the beautiful book design. And with regard to the book design, I need to also thank my friend Becky Jones for providing the photo for the book cover. It's a photo of the Susquehanna River, part of the landscape that both haunts these poems and serves as their home. And thank you to Michael Broder, the founding publisher of Indolent Books for taking a chance on this collection and for working to support me and this book in the middle of a pandemic. If you're not familiar with Indolent Books, you should go check out their website right after this reading for at least two reasons. One, so you can check out my Pressmates and the What Rough Beast series through which poets are responding to the COVID-19 crisis. And two, to buy a copy of this book. My wife, Brooke, and I are making a donation to Reclaim the Block in Minnesota, which is working to fund community-led safety initiatives in Minneapolis, in which this weekend, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, posted a petition representing their calls to the Minneapolis City Council to defund the police department and instead invest in resources that protect the health and well-being of the city's communities, especially its communities of color. For every person who buys this book directly from Indolent Books today and tomorrow, Brooke and I are going to add an additional $10 to our donation. Moreover, Indolent Books is going to donate 10% of the proceeds from this book the entire month of June to reclaim the block. So 
If you buy a copy anytime this month, Indolent Books will donate 10% to Reclaim the Block. And for everyone who buys a copy June 1st or June 2nd, Brooke and I will add an additional $10 to our own donation. Indolent Books planned the launch of this book in June to celebrate Pride Month, but this book launch also coincides with national crises that are exposing systemic injustices. So though supporting me as an individual will do very little toward addressing those injustices, I encourage you to buy this book so you can support Indolent Books, who does incredible work to advance not only poetry and the arts, but also social justice, in part by supporting underrepresented voices we need to be witnessing. And in supporting Indolent Books, you'll also be supporting Reclaim the Block, which is responding to, quoting from their website, the violence that police commit against black, brown, indigenous, queer, trans, immigrant, and disabled communities by focusing on shrinking the power of police, not changing their image or training. I've just got three more sets of quick thank yous here, and then I'll get to the reading. As an early career poet who has described herself as a minor American poet, I really can't sufficiently express my gratitude to the three poets I regard as major American poets who graciously wrote blurbs for this book, not just for the thoughtful comments they provided, which you can find on the back of the book or on my website, but also for their examples and what they do with their work as poets and as human beings. So thank you to Sandra Beasley, Kaja Kuypers, and Meg Day. My penultimate thank you goes to another writer to whom I can't sufficiently express my gratitude, Christine Friedlander, who has graciously and socially distantly held my hand through the process of figuring out how to market myself online. Thank you, Chrissy. And some of you know more than others just how much I should thank my wife, Brooke. The dedication at the beginning of this book is insufficient thanks for the ways she has supported me and my work. Although the life that informed these poems preceded the life she and I share together, as the dedication states, this book is for Brooke, for what is, and for what remains. And finally, now I'll begin by reading the final acknowledgement for this book, which is also really another thank you. And finally, thank you to the women with whom I shared a river and the formative moments that preceded this mythology. My last bit of prefatory material here to protect the innocent will just be to say that although most of these poems do have origin stories and in some cases even dedications, this book's mythology is true, but it's certainly not fact. I described the book as a kind of elegy exploring queer grief. And I've joked that this is just a fancy way of saying I wrote a book of lesbian breakup poems. Was Body is grieving the loss of a romance, but that romance that this book grieves is really an amalgamation of real life romances and imagined ones filtered largely through one speaker's perception. And I'd argue that even the speaker herself in these poems begins to realize the distance between whatever really happened and what she believes happened across time and place. That is all to say that the speaker of these poems is not, at least in all cases, a mouthpiece for this writer or who this writer is today. And the woman she is speaking to and about in these poems is not intended to represent or speak for any of the women I have ever loved or those who have made the honest mistake of loving a writer, specifically this one. These poems derive from the life I was living from about age 19 until about age 24, as I was coming out and coming into myself as a poet and as a queer woman, though I wrote many of these pieces at the end of this period or after it. Another way to think of this, these poems come from a time in my life that began around the time that Leona Lewis's Bleeding Love was topping the charts and ended around the time that Taylor Swift's We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together was. And arguably, you could probably read the whole book through the lenses of these two songs, but I digress. What's most important about the fact that these poems came out of this time in my life, I think, is that it was a time in my life when I was confronting and being confronted with cultural narratives about what it means to love women, but also what it means to be a woman. And interrogating those cultural narratives is part of what this speaker is doing through her grief. I'm gonna read 19 poems. If that sounds like a lot, fear not. Some of them are very short. Um, for about 25 to 28 minutes here, depending on how nervous I am and how quickly I read. And then we'll do a Q&A in the live chat. I won't look to the chat until I've finished reading, but please do feel free to keep participating in the conversation with each other or throw in questions during the reading because I'll come back to them at the end. 
a handful of you may have already witnessed earlier readings from this book, so you may witness some repeats here, but I'm also going to read some I haven't read before. And parents, when I have kids, I will probably let them read this, but know that I would also probably rate some of this content PG-13. And the poems do contain references to suicide, gun violence, and eating disorders. The first poem I'll read is the first poem from the book, Fun House Near a Sonnet 1 in Burt. It's one of four Fun House Mirror sonnets in the collection, whose titles I intend to suggest the warped perception the speaker has, not only of herself, but also of the woman she's speaking to and of in these poems. If you pre-ordered your copy of the book and want to follow along, you'll find this one on page three. Yeah, I'm like shaking, y'all. I can't even see you when I'm shaking. Fun House Mirror Sonnet 1, Invert. Your tongue pulses the well of my body, a desperate, throbbing heart. I pound wanton for what you look like wearing your organs outside your pearl bone corset, ungodly in slices of Susquehanna Valley, moonlight all lavender slick apparent. You are easier to touch, ribs unbent and beckoning like morning song, and we can rob each other's cavities this way, opened and primed for taking your angry, red meat, my carnal hunger for your blight, carbon. Your jawbones latched, you try to say love, but it keeps coming out, evolve me. Soon we'll find her rotting from the outside. The next two are part of a series of postcard poems that appear throughout the book. And I should credit poet Catherine Pierce with inspiring my adoption of the postcard as an epistolary form. Though we've never met personally, Pierce is a fellow alum of, the Sus of Susquehanna University, and her series of postcard poems in her first book, Famous Last Words, is something I now bring into just about every class I teach. The first two of these in this book appears on, appear on pages 28 and 29. Postcard left unaddressed one. Picture the upstairs window beneath the broken curtain rod. In the backyard, fermented apples. So in the mornings, sometimes I wake up and the neighbor's dog is stumbling just inside the perimeter. Fences don't divide, they just outline. I collected them all in a paper bag and now it's all rock bottomed out and I've spent a lot of time thinking about that night you slept in your own vomit in the middle of the living room. It's fall again. There's mold cider. I have your sweatshirt when you get cold. Postcard left unaddressed to, pictured behind the empty fishbowl. And y'all, while not all of this is factual, the fishbowl referenced here is real. When I was in college, I wrote and produced a musical about three lesbians who open up a coffee shop in central Pennsylvania. The name of the musical and the coffee shop was Fresh Ground. And the protagonist was named Leslie. So at the end of that academic year, two friends who would at different times be romantic partners bought me this beta fish and named him Leslie. And he then traveled with me across three different states for the next two years. And I loved him. And when he died, I was a graduate student and I was gracelessly grieving the loss of both these women and this fish from my life. And my incredibly patient grad school roommate endured living with me after she found me sobbing in the kitchen next to his fishbowl. So here's a thank you also to Erin Bresnitsky. She's not only incredibly patient, but she's also an incredibly talented playwright in New York City. And you should check out her website. Postcard left unaddressed too. Picture behind the empty fishbowl. Your mom called last week to ask how I was and if I had heard from you. I told her seashells. So I think she thinks you're at the beach because it was too hard to explain. I can hear you dying if I press my ears against the apartment walls, like they say you can hear the sound of the ocean. You'll find the next poem I'll read on page 16. Um, this is part of another series I was really into series at the time I was writing this project, which is perhaps indicative of some obsessive tendencies. The speaker's obsessive tendencies, of course, not the poets. There, there are three of these poems in this book, and they function kind of as these catalogs of memories the speaker is returning to, as if 
in returning to them, she can rewrite the ending they perceive, and in some cases, the ending they forecast. Perhaps as if changing some variable would change the outcome. So this is variable, X admits light. Shrimp in their limpid casings. Her red negligee hung at the street facing window, membranous as lace wing, layer over a wound. The momentary swell of her starved body before exhalation, perfectly blown glass. Olives remind her of whale skin, and so the diet is song. Most fever has reason, and so there is cause for heat. All of her logic is heliocentric. I still see the bulb of her. The next piece I'll read is called Because a Line Has No Endpoint, and it appears in seven short sections, beginning on page 43. This is a poem that really kind of addresses all the major themes that appear in the book, which include suicide, specifically grieving a suicide, as well as mental health more broadly, body dysmorphia and self-harm. I suggested earlier that the speaker of these poems is someone who's confronting definitions of what it means to be a woman or love women. She's also learning, sometimes gracelessly, what it means to be a person living with mental illness and its legacy, and learning again, sometimes gracelessly, what it means to love people who are living their own illness narratives. My father died by suicide when I was 16, so while that's more the focus of my first book than it is of this one, it's absolutely something whose traces are legible in this book, um, which I started writing in my early 20s. Because a line has no end point. One. If I tell you it hurts, I presume you'll ask where. The spangled bruise on my inner thigh, pointillistic. I'll tell you I threw my fist at it this week to keep it tender. It's my only lasting impression of your lips. Two, I know how to fire a gun, you say, when I indicate the healed points of his contact, now flesh color cooling. You kiss each gently and I recall our first night over blueberry table wine. How I told you my father put a pistol in his mouth. How yours taught you to shoot. How both of these were lessons in survival. Three. We talk about lines. You draw one from me with two fingers. Later, you put the same two fingers to the back of your throat, cry empty. Four. We make desperate emptying love in your loft bedroom for the first time in 11 months, both saying still, still. I take your hands down my side between hip and breast, tell you a tattoo artist in Pittsburgh will render a line there next month. You always talked about lines. Five, you fall asleep still drunk on wine, skin, water. You taste like water, you say like me. I wake to your spastic intakes of breath, hear the churning in your stomach, wonder if you've eaten this week. I dream of asphyxiation. In the morning, I ask you if you are hungry. Thirsty, you say, filling the well beneath my rib cage. Parched. Six. We sit outside the coffee shop parallel to the river, whispering words on each other's palms with our fingertips. Because I am leaving, I think of my father. Because I am leaving, you look at me and say, still. Because I am leaving, your eyes look just like his. Um, next, I'm going to read you three of my favorite poems in this book. And though I didn't know it at the time, they were kind of anticipating my third collection, Graft Fixation, uh, which will be out from Gold Wake Press next year. They were also anticipating my most recent chapbook, MRI, uh, out just last month in a limited series from Francis House, um, who did beautiful work on that. Um, if you visit my website later, you can find a direct link to the press there. A thank you to Tyler Friend and Francis House for their work on that. The chapbook uses my MRI images, and they set up the text of the poem so that it's superimposed. Um, so after I came out as a queer woman, I came out as a runner. And my relationship with distance running 
was a far more torrid love affair than the one featured in this book of poems. I'm not a distance runner anymore uh, because I was in an accident, which is the origin story of my next book of poems. But the three poems I'll read now from Was Body cobbled together mythologies of my father and his death and of this speaker's flawed understanding of her relationship with this woman she's talking to. In some ways, I guess this set of poems both echoes my first book, The Tree We Planted and Buried You In, which is an elegy for my father, and also anticipates the next book, Graph Fixation. Um, here's again running, and it's a prose poem, and the first of three in this series, and it appears on page six. Watching the attendance is kind of like nervously sitting on stage at a coffee shop or bar, right, and wondering why people have just gotten up and left, right? Like, what did you say that did it? <clears throat> anyway. This is again running. In the morning, the vessels thick at the periosteum in case, in case I surround you bones. Your body is a sheath thinning from waking when you're tallest. I remember my father in the kitchen in his underwear, his bakery apron folded over the chair. You were a child then in a state with mountains learning the layers. I was decorating cupcakes sometimes in the bakery. This was my histology learning how to write aorta over and over again with a pastry bag. You were eating or you were not. It was nervous, the sciatica after the 18 wheeler on the interstate, but my father knew only the word for joints. You were in Colorado with your hands on either side of the fault lines. I fault, I fault, I fault. He had a word for it in his other language, but it also meant tongue. His tongue had deep fissures. He told me not to jump from the kitchen table like that. His tongue had deep fissures from his teeth. He jumped. I can see him jumping from the window in that room, his brother behind him burning, the scar on his tongue like a sear. Forty years later, I was running. You were eating or you were not. My father with the scar on his tongue like a sear on the interstate. You were in Colorado with your hands. I was there and I was not dying. My patella was wearing. You were thinning. He was wearing my favorite shirt. I was running. The morning was hot like a sear. We were all alone. He was waiting, the pistol sear whose fault. My tongue ached thick as I ran. He waited the sear, the pistol against the scar on his tongue. The mouth, the lead encased the vessels thick at the cranial bones. He was tallest in the morning. You were in Colorado or you were not dying. I saw the fault lines in my knee running. Whose fault? Um, the next part of this series appears on page 36, and it's an erasure of the first poem, again running. Um, so this one is called Gunning. Gunning. Morning vessels thick. I surround your body when I remember my father folded over the chair. You were layers. I was sometimes histology, learning how to write aorta over and over again. You were eating. You were nervous sciatica after 18, but knew only the word for joints. You were Colorado with fault lines. I fault, I fault, I fault. A word for language, but it also meant tongue, deep fissures. He told me not to like deep fissures from his teeth. I can see him in that room burning like a seer. Four years later, I was eating. You were not. My father with the scar on his tongue like a seer. You were Colorado with your hands. I was my patella wearing. You were my favorite. I was running hot like a seer alone. He the pistol whose fault. My tongue ached as I ran the pistol against the mouth bones. He was tallest in the morning. You were or you were dying. I saw lines in my knee whose fault. Um, and the next poem, um, the last of the series, the final erasure, which appears on page 64, is called Un. Un. Vessels surround your body when I remember. You were layers. I was learning how to write aorta over you. You were nervous sciatica. You were Colorado with fault. I meant tongue deep. I can see that room burning like a seer. Forty years later, you were not like a seer. You were hands. You were hot, like the pistol whose fault ate mouth bones. You were dying. Lines. My fault. 
Uh, so the next poem is on page 33, and it's an adaptation on the poetic form of the guzzle, um, which is characterized by a refrain that repeats at the ends of the first two lines and then in the second line of each couplet from there. In this poem, that's the word vein, V-E-I-N, uh, though it also appears as vein, V-A-I-N, and in one more liberally interpreted variation. Um, the opening image that served as the impetus for this poem was this wild late October storm, I think in 2011, when I was in graduate school at Sarah Lawrence College, and I was driving from my apartment in Yonkers to my family in North Jersey, west on Route 80, and watching all of these trees that hadn't yet dropped their leaves just being overwhelmed by the weight of the snow and the frozen leaves and slouching onto the highway. And it was beautiful and terrifying. And like everything, obviously a metaphor for my own personal trauma. <clears throat> so this is called Weather Glass Prayer. Have you ever seen trees invert like that, weeping veins? You are my blood letting weather, my seeping vein attempt a drainage while a perennial snowfall. I tell you, revolver, circumvention, the cheap winged weather vane is all circles again. This is unseasonable egress, the cartilage ground given to torrent along the creeping vein. I am your fault line viaduct, wind rent you rendered me, winter's flay. I am tired of keeping vain tectonics, so here you quake and liquefy, precipitate avulsion. Magma blossom, tide rose, I pine in your deep spring vein. Uh, this next one is another one of my favorites, and I think that's because it's almost a snapshot of what this speaker's perception is of this time and this place in the book, however flawed that perception is. If I were writing an abstract for this book, this poem would maybe be that abstract. Um, and I failed to include this in the transcript, uh, but if you are following along, we'll find this one on page 61. This is voicemail on your birthday three years after you didn't do it. Because it's morning now in that backyard and the river is cresting and soon the floodwaters will be at the door of the cafe, I'm calling to tell you happy birthday and I'm sorry your eyes were always gravity, and I never knew where to put my hands. That's why I looked at you with that green immediacy when you sleepwalked your way into your car and drove to the grocery store. When you came, you writhed with seizure, so that winter was ecstatic, danger, like how you would stick your fingers inside me, then hold them like triggers against your skull, mouth, goodbye, over and over in sleep. Um, if you're following along, I'm moving to page 35, which is called Phantasmagoria Dark Room. Um, so Phantasmagoria is a word I tell my students is a quarter of a million dollar word, one they should drop at parties next year maybe. And it refers to a series of dreamlike images, real or imagined. In this collection, the Phantasmagoria is mostly a series of nightmare images, and this is one of them. Phantasmagoria, dark room. You rip the negatives from the strip and swallow them with cheap wine. When they call to tell me you've ruptured your stomach lining, I think only of flashes. I'll read another from that series, this one on page seven, because it serves as a nice segue into what I'll read next. The images from this poem originate both from a bar I can't remember the name of in New York uh, where my partner at the time and I had a group on, and from the first Pride Parade I attended in New York years before that. Phantasmagoria, gossamers. Spindling, the whites of eggs, and eyes on a familiar street, and whisked into cocktails. There were veils, so I thought of you, of holding, of hiding. The next poem is titled Epithalamian, which is a poem celebrating a marriage, though whether or not the speaker of this poem is celebrating the marriage that marks the occasion of the poem is debatable. This is in six sections, each of which is subtitled with a word that, like epithalamian, begins with the letters E-P-I-T-H. This starts on page 71. <clears throat> 
Um, and some of it shares imagery from that pride parade um, in Phantasmagoria Gossamers. It also references a photo my partner and I were pictured in at the National Equality March in October 2009. Just as a note, in the penultimate line of the first section, I do use the word dyke twice. The second time to represent the slur and the first time to represent a dam. I'm really into homophones, um, and in some ways they're more of a visual element in my poems than they, are, than they are sonic ones. If you're listening, rather than reading on the page, you don't know which dykes to watch out for. Virtual five, high five to everyone who knew uh, the Alison Bechtel reference. Uh, just another contextual note, this poem was written prior to June 26, 2015, and that day's Supreme Court decision. Epithalamian. One, epithet. You wore a veil and heavy mat. The train was bound for Penn Station. I was bound to you. I was bound to do this. Our painted faces facing both ways like rails, like history, locked wrists, mock cuffs. You kissed me so hungrily. Years later, there are still red pangs and the echo of a house with columns, a local paper that captioned how you wanted to marry me, to be able to. Don't apologize for your new stills, your wine, your truffles, the Arno River, or your ring, to be able to. I'm building a wall. Dyke, dyke, it's all collapsed. It's all the same. Two, epithalamus. I was inevitable or the body that embodied your inevitability. Not like a conveyor belt, you say, like a current. This is connection, survival, marriage pinpoints the pineal gland and all of your darkness, what hope of regulation. You're circling your circadian rhythms, rigor, mortis, how I can't unclench this, fist this net, work, your ulterior arterial knot. His proposal limbs the limbic. Nothing you or I can control. The next section is subtitled epiphany, which is an obsolete word for lust. Three, epiphany. A whole is just parts that refuse to acknowledge their loneliness. The way you come archaic to the touch, a pit like mine, I couldn't mind you, mind you, your cartouche inscribed when you told me you had pierced your clitoral hood, I kept racing like blood, flow to you, your sores, your source, your sorting, the vessels I buried. Four, epithem, which is a kind of poultice or salve. Wrapped like gauze in your bride white flax, you closed the door and opened, and I haven't found another way to say what you felt like, soothe, smooth against my palm, a prayer, a sob. Five, epithelium. You're a vascular, packed and selective absorption. I sin for you, I skin for you, but the song is nervous tissue now. You're innervated, I'm enervated. You're stratified and I'm not your cell anymore. You mentioned something about currents, again about surfacing, but I'm back in that studio on Pine where you told me I tasted, held against the soft palate like water. And the final section is entitled, uh, the subtitle is Epitheca, which is a layer specifically in the anatomy of certain kinds of coral that surrounds the theca. Six, Epitheca. Enclose in sheath the theca fully, how you take him how you took my hand inside your mouth, the mouth feel, how I felt to you, how I felt to you empty yourself. No longer what you know of consumption, I run my body clean. This is the gutting, how you lay exhausted on the kitchen floor, your chest heaving, the gentle cave, forgetting the whole. Um, the next poem I'll read appears on page 68 and it's called Warfare, Theme, and Variations. There are a few theme and variations poems in the book, and they all start with a title phrase. So in this case, warfare. 
And then the poems in this series move from line to line and section to section homophonically, echoing and transposing the sounds in the title phrase. This one is in six very short sections. Warfare, theme and variations. One, where is four? Munitions store. Real violence is in preparation. Two, worse for a broken shelter, the ruined well of thrombosis. Three, war Farron, after the swallow, had begged her to stop bleeding. Four, wherefore I tell you now because of all the collapsed causeways letting. Five, wear four pockets like cardiac chambers, vacant mouths. Six, where foreign now is plotting factors we learn to close. I'm gonna read just five more, all on the shorter side. Uh, the next one appears on page 37. And this is variable X emits light. Bell of her wine glass aptly formed as the well of her chapped mouth gasped open the similar expulsive shapes of climax and purge. Her skin and the spaces between my fingers in want and the flood lit gas station parking lot, the painted lines, the cheap coffee, the dream in which those hands flaked skeletal like the California pepper tree. These days I wear dark glasses because I believe in sanctum. These days her shirts are perfect bleach. These days I am tired of bone games. Um, if you're following along, the next one is on page 15. This, this series in the book is inspired uh, by humorism from the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates, who believed that four main body fluids um, and the balance of them in your body influenced your personality. So your balance of blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm, yum, gave you personalities that aligned with the sanguine temperament, choleric temperament, melancholic temperament, and phlegmatic temperament. I tell my students that one of my guilty pleasures as a poet is sometimes unpenning the pun and letting it overrun or overpun or overextending the extended metaphor. And I do that in this series and without apology. So this is myth of the choleric temperament or what gall. Get it? Because the choleric temperament is also associated with the gall bladder but also the speaker thinks this woman in this myth is full of herself, even though arguably the speaker is also a little bit full of herself. <clears throat> okay. Myth of the choleric temperament or what gall. Born high peaks at Laramie on a llama guilt morning, she hums unlike any other hominid, even the melodies recalcitrant. I crave her alkaline smile curved into the most basic basal cell. She milks me like sugar beet calls me her colostrum and lies Hippocratic in the paper hotel about harm. So disarming, her aviation dreams like propellers. And oh, bio beguile, she comes across such the sophisticate in her champagne stockings, all the legwork for trickery tight behind such teeth upon it. Um, I'll read one more of these four humor poems, which you may or may not find humorous. Uh, this one appears on page 70. And the title of the book is the namesake of the last line in this poem. You won't find the humorous joke in the transcript. That was an error. <laughs> Myth of the sanguine temperament or she's so vain. We built an inter-island highway for the sake of arrivals after. Her archipelago gesture cleaving, it was steep, upward gradient and mirrored an emaciated landfall, paved set onto the alluvial banks and stretched arterial across the river mouth. When you have measured the distance from the surface of your skin to your parotid, you can call this capillary Vegas. Her vaguest unquestionable music, she played the mouth organ, longing on basalt beaches, waiting for docking. It's important to know about geography and sediment the forests of inhabitable trunks there host to blight and gravity. And this was her garden with all of the car-shaped holes I drove circles through. 
Excuse my circumlocution. I was nervous. It was a system. She was liver. I was lover. This was body. Um, I'll read just two more and then we'll move to the Q&A. The next poem is the last of the variable series and it appears on page 65. Variable, X remits light. The pitcher of house ale she ordered for us to share and the suburban medium who claimed to know my father. Definitions of commune. Metallurgy, or the sharp new taste of her, clitoris after the Pine Street tattoo parlor. The erectile implies blood, which implies both reflection and absorption and certain frequencies. She has absolved herself of me, but I was there and the light on her back and the light on her back. Um, and I'll close with what may be the second earliest poem in the collection, though it also underwent some revision. I was writing from different fears and regrets when I wrote this poem, but its tone feels somehow timely. Um, so I'm gonna close with Reactor, which appears on page 59. Reactor. For the anniversary of the breaking, we built a fallout shelter in the backyard. Concrete, lead, dry earth packed from the garden section of a hardware store. We cut down the trees, radiation rains from branches, and left our clothes outside the blast hatch to minimize the hot introduced, rubbed our bodies together below ground, a new shape for memory. We planted a single mustard plant in a patch of earth under the heat lamp, nurtured it like anxiety, always just a little more water than it thirsted, slowly depleting our steel thermos provisions. What happened was more like an earthquake, was more like a shaking up, but you grew up just outside Three Mile Island where they said they tasted metal when the nuclear reactor malfunctioned, so you shivered when you saw the plumes. Feathering from the donut factory on our drive out of town for morning coffee, before our burial, a living time capsule. This is what we did to feel safe. Um, thank you. I'm gonna move over to the Q&A now and scroll back up to see who asked the first question and then we'll take it from there. Um, and Chrissy, if you don't mind helping me if I start fumbling, um, maybe you can help me navigate questions as they're coming down. Um, yes, Chrissy, if you'd be willing to repost questions that were asked earlier, that would be fantastic. Um, so I'm not bumbling up here. Um, and thank you all so much again for taking the time to witness this book launch. Um, and if you can, please do consider supporting Indolent Books and Reclaim the, box, the, the Block by purchasing a copy directly from the publisher. All right, and now I'll take questions, which might be the part of this I'm the most nervous about. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger, too, so I can see the text as the questions come in. All right, bear with me just a moment here. Here we go. All right. All right, so Elizabeth Deanna Morris Lakes, Liz asks, um, could you talk about how you looked at words that were similar and how those word blues either as slant rhymes or as component pieces of the words? Yeah, um, maybe I should choose a poem to talk about specifically. Um, in some ways, I made all the jokes about homophones. I probably should have been expecting this question um, or some version of it. Um, okay, so like I can talk about weather glass pair, I guess, on page 33. So this this is the one that um, kind of riffs off the form of the guzzle and has those those repeating end words. So vain, vain, weather vane is one of them. Um, so, and it's strange too. I, I barely even remember sitting down to write this. Um, I don't I don't mean this as a cop out answer. I'm going to get to the answer. Um, <clears throat> Recently, I was, I was at a reading um, where one of my colleagues and friends, Amy Archer, um, she was reading from her book, Fat Girl Skinny, um, and she's now working on projects that she say she says feel so distant from that project um, that it was it was almost like encountering this 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 alien object or this alien project. And part of me feels that way, although I'm definitely still playing with the puns and the homophones um, in my current work. Um, so I guess as a way to enter that question, when I teach 
um, poetry in the classroom and I talk to my students about rhyme um, or any relationships with sound on the page, what I say is, you know, if you've got two words that rhyme, especially if you've got them at the ends of lines, the, the poem is setting up a relationship between those words, right? Um, as Liz is suggesting, it's, it's creating some sort of connection between them. Um, so like here um, in the first two lines, have you ever seen trees invert like that, weeping veins? You are my blood letting weather, my seeping vein. Um, so that second vein is actually V-A-I-N. So the speaker here, um, as I see it, is saying, you know, the trees look like their veins are weeping. Um, there's like a physical comparison happening here. And then that leads the speaker to say, you are my bloodletting weather. Um, so we've got that connection to the vein and bloodletting, right? Um, but then the seeping is actually connected to vein. Like all of this is in vain. Um, she doesn't see the point of anything she's doing here. And then we go to the weather vein. Um, so there's this, this world that's being created um, through sound. And in this book anyway, I think it's, it's a world often of futility. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered your question, but maybe the way I got excited about it sort of answered the question. Um, so in my classes, my students and I talk about three umbrella impulses for poetry. And this, this is an oversimplification of, of three, these three impulses, but we talk about the lyric, um, we talk about the narrative, and then we, that, that is even more important than, um, than the sense it's making. It's saying my connection, I that went through. Uh, it's going to stay more precise about answering the rest of these apologies. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, I've got Chrissy's next question. Okay, Lisa, um, which I'm not sure is the question you're asking, Lisa. Also, Lisa, it's great to see your name. Hi. Um, but um, so I guess the first poem that I wrote for this book was in 2010, I guess. Um, I decided not to read it. it. It went through some revision, but it actually, the first poem in this book is called Hollandaise. I wrote it in 2010. Um, it went through some revision. Um, but I wrote it when I was 21, um, and I was in an undergraduate workshop um, with Gary Fink um, and with some other folks who may be at this reading right now. Um, but anyway, the last poem I wrote for this was probably in 2016, um, and then I had been sending the collection out um, probably beginning in 2014. So it took, um, I guess, about five years or four years um, for this one to, to find its home. Um, preparing for this, um, you'd have to ask my wife. I've been um, practicing all day and obsessively writing the transcript uh, the, the 48 hours preceding that. Uh, the virtual book launch, I definitely have to, to nod to um, my fellow writing community members in the way that they've been responding um, to uh, being under stay-at-home orders um, under the current crisis. So I've definitely been taking um, cues from them for that. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, I'm trying to find the next question. Okay, Heather asks, how do you choose the order or combination of poems for a reading? Um, yeah, I had a really hard time with that for this one. So I'm sure you noticed, um, even if you weren't following along, just in the numbers that I was reading and the ways that I was flipping, I didn't move through the book as I structured it for the book. Um, and I guess in the same way I was trying to create kind of an arc, but if I were to read, say, the first 19 poems in this book, um, I, I didn't feel that you would get a sense of the arc of, of the, the narratives that this, this speaker or these speakers are telling. Um, also, I was trying to keep in mind that I've got a mostly listening audience. Few people are going to be looking um, at the captions or at the book, at least in this, this first live interaction. Um, so thinking about what might translate best in this strange medium, um, and trying to show, I guess, a range of what's happening in the collection. Um, and also, frankly, because I imagine there are people present who know or, or think they know um, some of the figures who are mythologized in this work. Um, I, I was trying to be very careful um, to not inaccurately represent any of those figures people might interpret as being part of this collection, though again, um, nothing in here is at all intended to represent or speak for um, any of those people. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so Glenn, hi Glenn, asks, are your questions in the poem in one voice or more? Um, generally within any one poem, the questions are, are coming from one voice, but 
sometimes it's the speaker. Um, sometimes somebody else is, is speaking back to the speaker. So for example, um, and this is not a question in this case, um, but it will give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, in the longer one that I read, because a line has no endpoint, um, there's a place where, for example, um, the speaker remembers this, this beloved saying, I know how to fire a gun, you say. Um, so the speaker is reflecting on what this you has said. And, and I used italics to indicate that in most of this collection. Um, and so in many places, the italics, which, which obviously you can't see as I'm reading to you, um, function to signal the changes from voice to voice. Okay. Ian, hey Ian, he asks, um, what's the relationship between your music and your poetry? Do they occupy different parts of your mind or do you find they intermingle or that your approach is similar for both? Um, that's a really interesting question. And I know um, Ian has experiences with this too because he also writes um, both on the page, so to speak, and, and he writes music. Um, and, and I don't know, it, it's definitely, it is different. Um, and it's difficult for me to articulate specifically what that is. I think part of it is that um, at some point I decided that I was no longer a musician and I was a poet. Um, we don't have to get into that here. <laughs> um, but I, I do find the process to be different. Um, and maybe it's that even though it's, it's not, this makes no sense. I feel like I have more freedom in poetry than I, than I do in music. And that, again, that's, that's not an objective articulation and other people might would I'm sure feel exactly the opposite. Um, I guess I just also feel more in control um, of the musical associations within language, I guess. Um, of, of, so maybe that's the connection. Um, maybe the ways that music has continued really actively in my life is thinking about what music is on the page. Um, and also not only, not only the ways that that actually sounds, right, but the music suggested by relationships between words. Um, I hope that's kind of an answer. All right, Grace asks, cliche question here, but what was your favorite piece to write for this work or the most difficult? <laughs> and she says, thanks for making me cry during class night. So Grace was in my advanced poetry workshop, um, which just concluded, I guess, about a week and a half ago. Um, there were eight poets and me, um, and I said I wasn't gonna cry on the Zoom call, and y'all, did I cry on the Zoom call? Um, oof. Okay, my favorite piece to write for this. Okay. That's a question I should have been prepared to answer and I wasn't. Um, maybe the myth of the, the humorous poems, maybe. So myth of the choleric temperament, myth of the phlegmatic temperament, um, myth of the sanguine temperament, and myth of the melancholic temperament. I think those are really fun to write. And I remember um, part of the time I was writing them, I was at the library at Sarah Lawrence and I was just kind of, I was doing all of this research, basically going down what ended up being um, linguistic rabbit holes, really. Um, like, what is the language that surrounds these discussions? Um, and that was super fun for me. And I think it actually let me step aside um, from the, the more kind of like emotionally fraught or personally fraught uh, pieces in this. So those were probably the most fun. Which one was the most difficult? Um, whew. I guess that depends on how we're defining difficult. Um, difficult technically, Actually, I think the answer is the same for both. I think Epithalamian is the hardest poem in this collection to write for a couple of reasons. Um, one, and, and if you do buy the book, you'll see on the page, it looks really different um, from a lot of the book here. I think it's, I think it's the last one that I wrote. Um, and it was in response um, to a marriage that at the time I was definitely not celebrating. Um, and so I think the emotional center of that is part of what made it difficult. Um, but also that I was trying to carry these relationships with sound um, that in something like myth of the color temperament can be fun and playful, right? And I, I didn't want it to be playful in this poem. Um, so that was one of the things that was challenging. And I think the other thing that was challenging kind of comes back to my, my disclaimer at the beginning of the reading. Like um, when I was 21, I might've been bitter and resentful and not cared about how I portrayed um, the people who became the figures in this poem, um, or in these poems, rather. Um, but I am no longer that person, and I no longer feel that way. Um, so finding a way to, again, mythologize these experiences, um, 
but also in a way that is fair to the people who are distant from the figures in this book, but but who may bear resemblance to them. I think that was also a challenge. And, and to be honest, I'm not sure that I did it successfully all the time. Um, okay. Um, Chrissy asks, can you talk about your upcoming projects and books? Um, yes. Uh, so um, the chapbook I referenced before um, is, is kind of a part of my next book that's coming out. So this is called MRI, um, which there's another pun for you because there are MRIs in the book and it's called MRI. I'm the worst. I know. Um, but um, this is part of, these are two poems in this chapbook that are part of a larger project, Graph Fixation. Um, which is coming out with Gold Wake Press in January. Um, and the impetus for that book was that I, I was in a car accident um, about six years ago. And as I was kind of looking through things like the police report um, and my doctor's reports and correspondence I was getting from the insurance company, what I came to realize is something that's going to seem really obvious to many people here, um, is that other people were writing this story for me. Um, what was happening in my injury and recovery was being crafted um, in other voices and in other texts. Um, and I wanted to examine that and also resist it um, and find like, okay, well, what's, what's my story in this? Um, and so I, I took those documents. So I took things like my accident report, um, the surgeon's report, um, insurance correspondence, and I, I appropriated the language um, and the, the tone of that medical and legal language to, to craft these poems. And I also use my own MRIs. Um, and the part of that project that I found the most fun um, is uh, in 2013, there was a group of I think Princeton graduate students um, who developed this app called the What Would I Say app on Facebook. Some of you may remember. So you would log into Facebook. The website's still up, but I don't think the app generates anymore. Um, so you would click Make Me a Status. And the app would take the archive of everything you had ever posted to Facebook, which, yes, is really creepy, but we also all know it's out there already. Um, and using an algorithm, it would generate a status update that sounds like something you would say, um, so based on word order. And so part of the process for writing this collection, I would just sit there and generate statuses over and over again and then transcribe them. Um, and so I used the things that it generated. Um, to create text for the book, for a lot of these poems. Um, so I say one of my favorite lines, and I think it's, it's in this chapbook um, that, that this generated is, um, everybody gets a femur and a freight. Um, and so that sound relationship between a femur and a freight, I loved. Um, and so I played with things like that. Um, I was going to tell you something else about it really quickly. Oh, um, and so I've, I've actually got two lines from that book um, tattooed on my arm. This, this project also started as my dissertation, so there was a lot wrapped up in this. But another thing that this app generated um, was what this says, which is, I learned from the starting line, you have to decide if you move on. Um, and so it just generated these things that were really kind of content specific, um, so it was really cool. Um, and the other thing that I found really interesting about the process is it, it, it leads to questions about authorship, right? So if I'm sitting there clicking a button, am I really writing it? but I wrote the status updates. So does that give me credit for writing it? So it, there are all these kind of interesting theoretical questions. Um, so anyway, you can, you can read some of the poems that will be appearing in that book um, by going to my website. Um, and you can also check out the chat book that'll give you a feel for part of the project. Um, let's see. Anybody else have other questions? I was geeking out there, sorry. And thank you all of you who are just putting, putting comments in here. I, I'm going to go back and read through all of them and, and respond to you. Um, I will definitely get lost if I scroll up right now. I'm scrolling through to make sure I didn't miss any. I was expecting some really hard questions. Y'all were nice. Okay. Any poems you wanted to include here that you cut? Um, 
Yeah, the answer to that is definitely, and I'm trying to remember some specifically. Um, there's another theme in Variations poem um, that was published, um, I believe, in Entropy in 2017. It's on my website. There was called Release Theme in Variations. Um, but the way that it's moving from section to section is not formally consistent with the way that the poems in this book that our theme and variations poems move. Um, so I felt like I had to cut that one. Um, for years, I've been desperately trying to write this Sestina, um, whose title is Why It's Hard for Me to Watch Jennifer Lawrence. Um, <laughs> and I just, the, um, the tact that I was alluding to that I needed to establish and, and understanding that, you know, there are in fact real people who resemble the figures in these poems. I, I was not, I was not quite there in that poem. So why it's hard for me to watch Jennifer Lawrence has not yet appeared. Um, I also wrote this villanelle. Um, it, it, I, I wrote it when I was in grad school. It did, I did revise it a few times, but it, um, at first it was called Toothbrush Villanelle, um, and then it was called Villanelle as Floss, with the F in parentheses, so like Loss, but Floss, like really bad puns, really bad. Um, and the first line is, I finally threw out your toothbrush today. <laughs> um, and so that one had to get cut, even though part of me loved it, because I just, um, it, it didn't dignify, I don't think, the collection in the way that, that some of the other pieces do. Um, but yeah, there are definitely, definitely poems that I um, wanted to include that I cut. Um, and some of those I'm hoping to, to kind of revise and, and put toward a different collection, right? So, so maybe that's, that's a boon. I can tell you a quick funny story while we wait to see if anybody has any questions. Um, I don't know if Grace is still here. Um, I've told this story several times. So um, Grace got grant funding to come to AWP with me last year. Um, and it was, it was quite the adventure. I'll, I'll save this part of the story. In short, our flight got canceled. We ended up taking two additional flights, renting a car. It's amazing we made it there in the first place. But anyway, we get there and um, so I shared this in the post about, about the, uh, the reading. I said, you know, I actually find self-promotion to be really, really uncomfortable, um, which is funny because I'm quite an oversharer, as many of you know. Um, and anyway, we get to AWP, and Grace is looking at the, the conference, um, the schedule. Melissa laughing, maybe because she remembers this story. Uh, or she definitely remembers the travel part of the story. She was instrumental in uh, making it happen. And anyway, so Grace looks at the conference schedule and says, you know, there's a panel here you might want to attend. And it's called, um, Have I Said Too Much? The Professor-Student Relationship. <laughs> um, and I actually was unable to attend because uh, I was attending something else at the time. But that's, it's very unfortunate because it was, it, it seemed to be tailor-made for me. So there's a funny story for you. Any other folks have questions or comments? There's still a lot of people here. Thank you, thank you all so much. Okay, here we go. All right, Kara, great to hear your work and of the journey. Could you speak more to the struggle I imagine over so many years um, for others maybe trying to write memoir-esque or auto-fiction? Okay, um, so maybe I'll talk about that both in terms of this book and in terms of the next book. Um, because I'm not sure um, which one specifically you're asking about, Kara. Um, I'm thinking about how you talk of the voice as speaker. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the speaker versus the poet, um, this is a thing I'm like obnoxiously indignant about in the classroom. So one of the first things I tell students when they come into my, my poetry classes is um, you're not going to assume that the voice on the page is the voice of the poet unless you've got really compelling evidence for that. Um, and often there's not compelling evidence. 
um, even if you're doing kind of a deep dive into the author's biography, you might be able to find some things that suggest, okay, well, maybe that's what this is about. Um, but I'm really, really kind of hesitant about that, um, especially with things like, um, especially writers who have killed themselves, to go back to this discussion about suicide and grieving suicide. Um, I think there's a really common inclination with, with poets um, who have died in this particular way to take a poem of, of Sylvia Plath's, for example, um, and then pull out a line and then have a reader say automatically, well, because I know that this is how she died, this must be referencing her personal experience. And what I tell students is, you know, it, it, may, it very well may be, um, but I want you to work with the evidence on the page. Um, so I guess in separating myself from the speakers of these poems, there are kind of two things that I'm doing here. One, I, I want the book to, I want it to do what it's doing on the page with or without me. Um, and that may mean that I don't interpret um, what I intended to do the same way you, the reader, do. And I, I think that's actually kind of great. Um, and part of it's that even though this did come, in, in many cases, from real experiences, I, I don't intend it to be um, a true story, right? I, I did say earlier, this is true, but it's not fact. I don't intend for anybody to pick this up and try to figure out what my college years were like, for example, um, although I'm sure people will. Uh, so, so part of it's that. Um, to have the freedom, and part of it's also to have the freedom to craft something else out of it, right? So one of the things I said, um, again, I'm, I'm really grateful um, for the poets who blurbed this book, and, and I want to share what Keisha Kuiper says at the beginning of her blurb. So she says, it feels dangerous to build an entire collection around a single love affair, but Tadros is willing to take the risk. In some ways, that was the greatest compliment I could have received about this book, because what informed it was actually a number of love affairs. I was going to say a lot of love affairs. We don't need to put numbers to it. Um, in short, it was more than one, but the fact that it reads as something cohesive means I created something out of that, something that is other than that experience. Um, I talked around that, so I don't know <laughs> if I answered your question. Um, but yeah, I, I see the, the speaker as an opportunity to, to create something else, um, to create something more, to learn something else about it. And I'm laughing because Liz, who went to college with me, says, luckily, I don't need to figure out your college experience. Okay. So James asks, Kristen and I watched the whole thing. Great to see you. Oh, that's not a question. Sorry. Air five back at you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Other questions? People are starting to leave the bar, but folks are still hanging around ordering drinks. We could also just sit here and enjoy the ambiance. I, I lit candles for y'all. Mm. Okay, so Kara says, um, again, about this question of speaker versus author. Um, I'm wondering what freedom it gives you in terms of sharing a coming out story. Yeah, I think it gives me a lot of freedom um, in a lot of ways. Um, so let me think about how I want to answer this. Um, yeah. Um, well, I guess it, it allows me to theorize, I guess, is the word that I often like to use in the classroom. Um, so th there's a book, um, that in some ways is, is more related to my, my next book. Um, Arthur Frank, um, who's a sociologist wrote this book called the wounded storyteller, um, body illness and ethics. And in his preface, he makes this claim and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I've almost got it verbatim. Um, that, you know, when he was in graduate school, he was often taught that this theory requires further, further study, I think is how he says it. This theory requires further study or further experimentation. Um, and then he came to a point where he found himself articulating that this theory requires further living. Um, and so I guess how I think about that in terms of a coming out story um, is that 
having a separation from the speaker actually allows me to keep living um, and theorizing in some way. Um, and part of it's also because if I'm, I'm going to be frank, um, like I'm just a pillar of privilege this week in particular um, in, in ways that um, both do and, and don't need to be acknowledged right here. I mean, um, but, but also in terms of my coming out story, like um, my mom, who I think is probably still watching, um, I, I came home like one college weekend and my girlfriend at the time and I were wearing promise rings and I'm, I'm going to change her name in the story here to protect the innocent. Um, but, um, you know, my mom saw that I was wearing this ring and, and she said, you know, like, what's, what's that about? Um, and I'm, I'm skipping ahead of the story here, but I, I basically go on to say, well, mom, I'm not gay. I'm just dating Ellen. Um, and of course that would have been a totally viable description of my sexual identity also to say I, I wasn't gay. I was just dating Ellen, except I wasn't just dating Ellen. Um, but all of that is to say that my mom, um, was incredibly supportive and welcoming and as were most of the people in my circle. So, so coming out was not, um, there was not a lot of friction there, um, the way that there is for, for so many people, um, many people that I, that I speak with on a daily basis. So I guess in that sense, like that's, that's not the story that I was theorizing, um, through the speaker, but I was, I was trying to figure out, okay, well, what, what does it mean to be handed these, these ideas of what it means to be, um, a woman or be a woman who dates women, a woman who loves women. And then what, what can we kind of interrogate about those narratives? And I, I think, um, the speaker in these poems is, is pretty early on in that process because the poet was early on in that process too. And I'm, I'm talking in circles and I hope I said something useful there. Um, okay. So James asked, um, if you could talk a little bit more about the three poetic impulses. Um, yeah. So we talk about the lyric, um, and other people still sitting here are probably even more experts on the lyric tradition than I am. Um, but we talk about, you know, the, the tendency to have a first person, um, a speaker who's using I, um, and this, this capturing an emotional moment. Um, so, so it's capturing an emotion, which is also usually a moment in time, right? And we talk about the narrative. So a poem that tells a story. Um, that's the one that I think is, is easiest, um, at, at least for students to identify. And then as an umbrella, um, we talk about language oriented poetry and, and the text that I was using when I broke this into these three approaches, um, some of you may remember is um, an exaltation of forms. Um, so edited by um, Finch and Barnes. Um, it was a, a textbook that I used um, as an undergraduate. Um, but anyway, this idea of language oriented poems, um, one example would be something like Gertrude Stein's Tender Buttons, right? You could argue um, that what those pieces are doing on the page is more interested in, in playing with what language does as a material, right, than, than what it does in creating sense. And that's not to say that you can't make sense of what's on the page there, um, but it's not, it doesn't make the kind of semantic sense that the sentence I'm trying to deliver right now is, right? And I say trying because I'm notoriously inarticulate when I don't have a transcript in front of me. Um, but so, so playing with associations and what words look like and what we think they sound like, um, rather than saying, okay, well, what does this mean? And I think that's really freeing too and fun. I don't know if anybody wants to talk about metaphor, but while you think about whether or not you have other questions or freshen your drinks or um, decide whether or not you're leaving the bar or the coffee shop, um, I will share with you my favorite statement about metaphor. Um, and if any of my students are still sitting here, some of you can probably mouth this verbatim with me. Um, so there's, there's an essay um, that I bring into a lot of my classes by Alicia Ostreicher, and it's called Metaphor and Healing or Why Metaphor is Not a Bandage. I think I got the title right there. Um, but she basically, she defines metaphor as the erotic element in language, um, in the connections it makes, right? Um, and this part I'm, I'm just kind of summarizing. Um, you know, one of the things she says about metaphor is that it, it can never fully describe. So let me give you an example. Um, when I was a kid, this is the example I often bring in classes. I was, I was seven years old, I think, and I had a migraine, but I didn't know the word migraine. Um, and I was trying to explain to my parents the pain that I was feeling. And what I remember saying is that I had a beeping headache. 
And when I used the word beeping, what I was remembering specifically was um, our digital alarm clock with the red digits, right? And, and the way it would blink and like scream, the beeping, right? Um, that's, that's what my head felt like. Um, and no matter what, so even though I didn't know the word migraine, I, I could never get, let me give you the definition. I'm, I'm babbling now. Anyway, Ostriker basically defines metaphor as an agreement that the distance between two things is cancelable because of their likeness, whereby each one eliminate, each eliminates some inner truth belonging to the other. So in short, um, by comparing a migraine to a beeping alarm clock, um, I learn more about both of those things than I would than if they were not together. But at the same time, they'll never be the same thing, right? Um, so that's why she calls it the erotic element. Like these things try to fuse, they try to join, but they never actually can. Um, and Chrissy's doing a good job of reining me in here. So we'll take one more question if anybody has it. Last call at the bar. It's amazing because so many of y'all are still sitting there. At least that's what YouTube tells me. It must be because I dressed up. Thank you. Well, maybe we'll do this instead. Um, since it doesn't look like anybody has any more questions, um, I'll read one more poem and then we'll close this out. All right, um, so I'll read you the last poem in the book and then we'll finish there. Um, so this, the last poem in the book um, is the last postcard poem. It's postcard left unaddressed five. Pictured, a shallow depression in the linens, your side of the bed. I went to dinner with a new woman last night. Her body was like driving in a new city, a foreign grid. When I made love to you, I often thought of coloring books of the dark, outlines of images, the shaded chambers of your ribs. From my window, I watched the switchboard lights alternate and disappear, delicate circuitry, and you wrap yourself in your old college sweatshirt against the night of another, weather, grieving a quiet, meteorology, like waiting for rain, and ask how high the water is this time of year, where we were. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. Um, I hope you're doing and staying well. Um, have a good night. My wife is releasing the dogs. They're allowed to come back into the living room, so I'm, I'm going to end the stream now. Uh, thank you so much. Um, feel free to email me. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>